All right, thank you, Candace, so much for that introduction. Um, I'm so pleased to be welcomed by our guest, Madam Secretary uh, Fudge, um, who I don't care wherever you are right now, um, do yourselves a favor, say good afternoon to <laughs> Secretary Fudge, <laughs> uh, because I'm sure some of you saw the viral moment that she had where she got um, my fellow journalists all the way together, because one thing you don't do, since we're talking about the state of Black America, one thing you don't do is when somebody Black speaks, you better speak back, <laughs> especially if they're in your house. Um, but what was underscored about that moment, as much fun as we all had with it on Twitter and commending you for your quote-unquote auntie energy, is that in that same press conference, uh, Madam Secretary, you were asking uh, or calling on Congress for an additional $100 billion dollars to give to housing and urban uh, urban development. And one of the things I was struck by, by what you said was that right now there was a once in a lifetime opportunity to reverse course on a lot of entrance issues um, in the department and, and with the housing crisis overall. What were those issues you were referring to and why do you think now is the time to address them? First off, thank you, my friend, for having me today. Uh, yeah, I'm from I'm old school. I mean, I learned I learned as a young child that that's just respectful. Um, and I think that it is important for us to understand that we are at a tipping point in our country's history. We right now have a president that believes in bold thinking. He believes in moving things in a big way. And so he is putting the resources behind the kinds of things that we need to make the the playing field level. Uh, we've always had a desire to do things. We've always been able to do them, but we didn't have the will. And now we have the will. And I say it's historic because homeownership, and we know this uh, ourselves, homeownership is the place at which most people of color start to build wealth, especially generational wealth, because they hand it down to their children and grandchildren. But the playing field has always been unlevel because we look at the, the difficulties in buying homes for people of color, whether it is redlining, whether it is access to credit, or whether it is how we look at credit. I mean, something as simple, Jamel, is, is they weight differently student loan debt when they look at your credit scores. Most black and brown people have student loan debt. They look at things like your credit card debt, things that really are not necessary to be weighted differently to determine whether you are credit worthy, but that is what they do. So it is in fact systemic, uh, it is pervasive across every agency, but in particular with housing. When you think about public housing, uh, we know that of the 2.3 million or so people who live in public housing, more than 1 million of them are people of color. And we never create the pathways to move forward. That is why this is an important time. We're going to get the resources necessary to allow people access to home ownership, to training, to jobs. This is the time, and so we have to take advantage of it. Uh, another um, issue that the Biden administration hopes to address is, is homelessness, um, especially with the pandemic. Um, per your office, I know you don't have a completely firm number uh, that you can perhaps give us, or maybe you do at this point, because I know um, there was some, uh, you know, uh, there was some more information that was needed in terms of the number of actual uh, homeless people that were created by the pandemic. But nevertheless, it's a huge issue in this country. Uh, how do you see this being addressed in a different way under this administration? One of the things I'm so excited about is that there is $5 billion in this rescue plan to do nothing but address homelessness. I think people do not understand the severity and how big this problem is. Prior to COVID, in January 2020, on any single night, more than 580,000 people were homeless in this country, 40% of those people being people of color. So this $5 billion that we're just allocating now, as well as emergency vouchers, another $5 billion in just vouchers, to get people off the streets, to get them in places that are not shelters, because we don't want to create a, a worse problem by putting people in congregate uh, environments, but to actually 
build new housing, to give vouchers to move into areas that maybe are more beneficial to them, but to also just temporarily get people off the streets and put them in some stable housing. So the commitment is there. It is over $10 billion between the two. And we are allowing communities to do what is best for them. You live in Los Angeles. Your mayor has already purchased um, small hotels and motels to house the homeless. Now they can make that permanent because the resources are there for your community to do it. As well as we are talking about building single-family housing for low-income and affordable pe uh, housing. Uh, there are so many things that are on the table right now. The resources are there. We just need to be ready for the opportunities. Uh, many of us are familiar with policies like redlining and how, in, in other ways, housing discrimination has long existed in this country. But in 2021, what does inequitable and uh, unfair housing practices, what does it look like in the modern day? Just think about it this way. There are communities all over Ohio and almost every other city where you can actually go in and purchase a home for thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in neighborhoods that people have just disinvested in for years, uh, and rehabilitate those homes and start to empower and rehabilitate communities. But most banks or most lenders, including FHA, doesn't want to give you a loan for thirty or forty thousand dollars to rehabilitate it. But what is happening in communities all across the country is people who can afford to buy them are going in, they are buying these homes, and they are changing these communities. I live in Washington, D.C. There are places now that you see uh, upper-income people live that we never could have lived because we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford to take those same houses and put $100,000 in them or $200,000 in them. So that's the first thing. And that also goes to the fact that we don't lend in certain areas, period, no matter the cost. Uh, the other thing is we have people who, in particular in real estate, who will steer people away from uh, opportunity communities. They want to steer us to places where they think we belong. And then lastly, and most importantly, is just access to credit and lack of down payments. Most people of color can afford to pay their mortgage. Most people know that their mortgages are generally less than their rent, but it's getting into the process, getting into the system. So we don't provide the kind of uh, education, the kind of counseling, nor the down payment assistance most people who are low income or moderate income need to buy a house. You put uh, racial inequity at the forefront of your agenda for this office. How will addressing racial inequity in housing lead to us maybe having a different kind of conversation or different kinds of results when it comes to addressing racism in America? You know, we have for generations dealt with seen and unseen racism, uh, overt and covert racism. It is now time to pull the cover off. We know that based on uh, the lack of investment in public education, especially in communities of color, uh, the lack of investment period, whether it be the equipment that schools need, whether it be um, fixing roads and bridges, whether it's access to transportation to take us to jobs, all of those things have been in some way influenced by racism. You look in communities now where they've built highways through black neighborhoods, where they have schools that have leaking roofs, uh, where kids can't even go to school in the summer because there's no air conditioning, or in the winter because there's no heat. And so we have made it difficult for people who are trying to make it, most of them us, uh, and so it is time to turn it around. So you have to look at it through a racial lens. Otherwise, you won't see it. You will just think it is business as usual. Since this country is so predisposed to believe that people who don't work don't want to, or people who live in public housing choose to, uh, it is a design of the system to make sure that we only go so far. Mm. Uh, you mentioned something important there, because it's something I've noticed as well, is that there is this idea that people who are in poverty or people who are in public housing are there because they simply lack the will, lack the morality to make their situation better. Uh, how do these attitudes impact 
convincing people who maybe aren't in those situations uh, that people in public housing, uh, people in these situations deserve help? I think there are a number of things that we have to talk about. One is that there was a time when you could come out of high school and get a good job because we were a manufacturing society. Today, we are a service society. So you've got automation, you know, you've got robots that have taken a lot of jobs in, in factories at places. You have technology uh, that has put people out of work. And then you have lack of an effort to make sure that people who do not, quote unquote, want to go to college have a skill. I believe every person that comes out of high school should have some kind of a skill, whether it is to move to being a brick mason or a, um, a plumber or an electrician or to take the path to go to college. Those are options that we so often do not have. Uh, and so what we also, I think, uh, fail to realize is that most people who live in public housing who can work do work. We make an, an, uh, an assumption, and it's, and it's one that is not accurate, that people, everybody there doesn't work. The majority of people who live in public housing are seniors, they are children, they are disabled. There are very few, at least by ratio, numbers of people who are capable of working. And so we have to stop uh, looking down our noses at people who need our help. That is what we do. That is the mission of HUD and every other agency of this nation. And so we have to do our part to start to empower the people who live there. So we want apprenticeship programs so that all of the building that's going to be going on over the next few years includes people who live in our communities. We want to be sure that there are training programs, especially in community colleges and other people, so that our people are trained. It is, it is intentional. It has to be intentional that we make sure that people who we know need our help get it. And it, it is not certainly outsourced as, it is, as, as it's been all of my life. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Madam Secretary, right now, as many of us know, there's a $2 trillion infrastructure package that Joe Biden and his team have, have put together in hopes that it will pass through Congress. How would this package impact your office if it is uh, if it is passed by Congress? If we pass this jobs package, infrastructure package, it is going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Most of those jobs do not require a, a college degree. Most of them, high school or lower. So that is the first thing that I'm excited about because that means that communities that have been forgotten have a shot at getting these resources. As well as we are going to rehabilitate uh, public housing. You know for yourself, if you've ever been into one of these units that are more than 50 years old and you've seen mold on the walls or lead in the paint, it needs to be addressed and it has been neglected for too long. We're going to build new single family affordable homes to give those people who have the ability, the opportunity to move into their own space. Uh, we are going to do so many things that I think are going to be so good for this country. I cannot tell you how pleased I am to be a part of this administration because they see the problem. But not only do they see it, they want to do something about it. Uh, I, and forgive me, uh, Secretary, I lied when I said that was the last question. I have one more <laughs> that, that I'd love to ask you. Uh, is there anything that you feel um, right now is being under addressed? There's a lot of issues. Um, of course, as you mentioned, what the infrastructure package could potentially do, uh, the, the nation's homelessness problem, which we've already discussed. Are there maybe, is there an issue that's maybe percolating right now that you feel as if because of the other issues is, has the potential to be ignored or overlooked? Well, I mean, I can't, uh, I'm still a, a citizen of this great nation. I can't overlook uh, what is happening across this country as it relates to uh, policing as it relates to uh, the fact that we are in an, an environment, this COVID environment, which makes things more difficult when you look at the rises of domestic violence and abuse because of the COVID situation, when you look at the uneven and unfair way the vaccines have been administered. There's so many issues 
uh, that there are too many for somebody like me to tackle alone. But I think that what we need to do as, as a community, as black people, is to t determine what our priorities are and move them. Housing clearly is a priority. You have to have a foundation upon which to grow. That's housing. But there are so many other things. There's student debt. Uh, I mean, Jamil, I could just go on and on, but I am most concerned about the mental health of my people as we continue to see black and brown people treated so unfairly uh, by our judicial system. Not just the police, the entire system needs to be um, reformed. Uh, but I just want us to come out of this hole because the weight is so very heavy right now for so many of us because our hands are tied and we don't know what to do from here. But I just want for especially the young people who are out here raising their voices, I'm so very proud of you and continue to do it because you now are our hope. So give it the best you've got. Um, well, thank you for that encouraging words and for this conversation, uh, Madam Secretary. Really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure everybody that sees you on the street definitely greets you after <laughs> the lessons <laughs> and manners that you gave everybody. So good afternoon to you, and I hope to see you good soon. Afternoon. And <laughs> with that, I'm going to send things back to Candace. Thank you.